This week, Paul and I interview Dr. Jing She, security analyst and product manager at Venify. In the news, security pros raise concerns about WordPress's new protection feature, White Screen of Death. Proposed Google Chrome changes could destroy ad blockers, and websites can steal browser data via extensions APIs. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences Next Gen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps tool chain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome, everyone, to episode 48, our 49th episode of Application Security Weekly. I am, of course, your host, Keith Hoodlett. I'm excited to be joined once again by my illustrious co-host, Paul Asadorian. Hey, thanks, Keith. What's going on, my friend? It's good to be here. Not, not a whole lot. I'm looking forward to the Super Bowl this coming weekend. Got some friends coming by. And nice. uh, yeah, needless to say, being from New England, it, it's, you know, it's good to be a Pats fan. So <laughs> we're probably going to get some hate for that. But hey, man, it's right. good. From basically everyone outside of New England. <laughs> Well, that in Louisiana, right? Like, you know, the New Orleans Saints got robbed. Um, so we're just going to leave it at that because, you know, I'm sure not too many of our listeners watch sports, but for those that do, they will understand. Mm-hmm. So one quick announcement, then we're going to jump into the news before we do our interview this time around. So first of all, uh, RSA Conference 2019 is the place to be for the latest in cybersecurity data, innovation, and thought leadership. From March 4th to the 8th in San Francisco, it will come alive with cybersecurity's brightest minds as they gather to discuss the industry's newest developments. Go to the rsaconference.com slash securityweekly-us19 website to register now using the discount code 5 utah 9 Sierra Whiskey Foxtrot Delta. That's 5 utah 9 Sierra Whiskey Foxtrot Delta to receive $100 off a full conference pass. How did you, Paul? I think I got it this time, finally. I think we got it. <laughs> nice. I know that otherwise Doug would be yelling at me from you know his his uh, office and or couch. Uh, it's Utah. No, it's, <laughs> so. I, it's uniform. I think it's actually uniform. Someone on Twitter corrected us. Uh, well, I think, you know, I, think I continue we need to, to get it is, wrong. I'll save it for next week then. <laughs> well, I think in the notes in the teleprompter moving forward, we should make sure we spell it all out. It's hard because yeah, remote right? hosts, you don't necessarily have a teleprompter, but we send you the same file, I'm assuming, so. Yeah, for me, it's just a, it's a pages uh, note, and I literally did type out the words uh, so that way I actually said it appropriately this time. So hey, next next week, I'll get it actually correct. But in the meantime, we're going to cover the application security news for the week of January 27th, and we have quite a doozy, I think, in store. First, Paul, this whole new WordPress white screen of death thing, um, I think, you know, in, in uh, principle, kind of a cool idea in practice. Not a great idea at all. Did you read up at all for this before we jump in? I did. My question was like, how much functionality um, is there when it's in the white screen of death mode? Or is that white screen of death error message only come up if you're accessing a part of your WordPress site that's experiencing the issue? But I'm assuming if you've botched PHP, your whole site's probably going to not be functioning, which then is it vulnerable if it's not really functioning? That was my question. (laughs) <laughs> my understanding is if you walk into a part of the site that is not functioning properly, that's where you hit the, mm. effectively it's a, a blank 404 page with a login link to your admin panel to fix your stuff. Um, so it's not, it's not really like, I don't know, groundbreaking per yeah. se. I mean, no, most I agree people would that, hit a 404 yeah. page and it right. wouldn't be like a huge deal anyway, but this is, it's in reaction to people that are migrating from the PHP 5.x to the 7.x branches. Uh, and it was intended for those people that were updating their WordPress instances accordingly. Now, the thing that's bad about it is that it, it can basically cause plugins uh, such as, you know, themes, etc., to be turned off by the administrator if those are identified as or flagged as causing the outage on your page. 
So hmm. in practice, like, you know, it, they mean well at the end of the day, right? Like your theme's broken or one of your plugins is broken. And so it, it kind of flags you to go and turn that off inside of your admin panel. Mm. But as security researchers have rightly pointed out, any number of malicious inputs could cause a, I don't know, uh, like a, a security tool to prevent the, uh, you know, input to go through causing a white screen of death, causing the admin to be like, oh, hey, that page is broken and going and turning off the security protections that they've put in place. Um, so, like, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I get don't know, it, Paul, I'm right? conflicted. Yeah, I, I hear it. I'm conflicted too. I think um, our WordPress hosting provider is pretty awesome. Uh, they are not a sponsor of the show, but I really like them. So I'll give them a plug. Uh, WP Engine is where we host um, all of our WordPress today. Yes, all of our WordPress today is now hosted there. And we were upgrading the PHP 7, you know, a while ago, and they take care of a lot of the uh, backend processing for all of that and made it made it pretty easy. And I have to tell you and speak with them, I mean, they're like total ninjas uh, and their stuff works well. The nice part about their site when it we're talking about upgrading is you can very easily do snapshots and build entirely. So inside of your environment, you can do snapshots, then you can create an entirely new dev environment that has its own snapshots and a whole QA environment that has its own snapshots. So this doesn't even apply. Like if you're on a platform such as WP Engine, it doesn't really apply because I would just test something. And if it broke, I would just revert to snapshot and not have to worry about even interfacing with this white screen of death. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's one of those situations where, um, I mean, there there have got to be a number of people out there to, that are still hosting their own WordPress instance. Oh, I certainly. imagine that's yeah. probably the case. Like the probably, I don't know. I, I'd say if I had to hazard a guess, and this is totally off the cuff, no scientific research done whatsoever, but I would imagine something like seventy five percent of uh, of WordPress instances are probably self hosted or you know hosted in the cloud somewhere um, on a Amazon box, EC two, or on a you know well, digital yeah. ocean. And don't and don't forget that for our listeners a lot of the other applications that you might be installing are also PHP based applications. So I just did media wiki, orange scrum and mantis bug tracker. I'm pretty sure all three of those were sold or I, they might have some other languages, you know, or uh, libraries in there, but for the most part, I mean, they're lamp applications or PHP with a database backend on Linux type applications. Uh, and fortunately, the ones I've chosen look like they were supporting the latest version. So made sure my OS was up to date, make sure I was using PHP 7.2, uh, and make sure they supported that. And they all, other projects seem to have updated so that 7.2 support is not a big deal. You know, it's funny. For those that are, you know, conflicted on moving to PHP 7.2, uh, a few things. First, your PHP 5.6 is now end of life and is not mm -hmm. going to get any security updates. Mm -hmm. And two, I saw something interesting, and I have not confirmed this, so this is wild speculation and rumor, but apparently uh, PHP 7 code is 50% more efficient. So you're actually saving the planet a little bit by running your server in PHP 7 as opposed to PHP 5.6. It's, so funny, it's funny you say that. I don't have any scientific data to to back this up but to me Keith it feels faster like the applications that I installed with 7.2 they're not on gigantic systems either I mean they're just internal you know support applications yeah. um, but so they're not heavily trafficked either but my boxes in the cloud that I'm building these on are not that big at all and all the applications seem pretty fast uh, so I would I, I can't say I can validate that claim but I haven't experienced the opposite where I'm like oh my god it's so slow well, and the interesting thing about that is the human like eye, uh, or maybe even it's the human brain, can't even register things as being different unless they think it's like twenty milliseconds or a couple yeah, hundred something milliseconds. Significant, I can't recall exactly right? what it is, but it's it, it's enough where most of the time, if you have a, a, a you know even a millisecond change that moves the needle by that much, um, you actually feel like the performance is faster, even if it's only you know very marginally faster. So. Right. And if um, I had my fancy new monitoring system on there, which I have not yet put on some of my internet facing systems due to security concerns that I need to validate before I do that. Um, have you ever played right. around with Zabbix before? I've not. Tell me more. So it's very, it's similar to Nagios um, Shuriken. Is that the other one that was like the Nagios, uh, the subsequent project after that? Uh, there's a bunch of projects that are basically like systems type monitoring 
uh, we yep. went with Zabbix, and we actually just used it this morning for the first time to go, that system was acting funny. Let's go see what Zabbix knew, and there was a CPU spike uh, during that time. So it's not necessarily security specific. However, it's collecting telemetry that can absolutely be applied to performance tuning, to security testing, whatever you know, security related activities you're doing, forensics, incident response. Um, so, I, so far, so good. I'm not, you know, comfortable giving it my full endorsement and doing tech segments on it just yet. We are working on those. Um, so we'll see. But you know, that that's another thing where if I had that on there, I could have measured you know, the performance differences, perhaps. But right, right. I mean, and that's one of those things that, um, as they say, the more data you have, the the more you know. Uh, and knowledge is half the battle. Absolutely. But by the way, do you know what the other half of the battle is, Paul? I just learned this recently. Um, knowing. But what's the isn't knowing was half the battle, but what's the other half is the question, right? Yeah, yes. Uh, so it is 25% red lasers and 25% blue lasers. Ah. Is that, <laughs> is that a G.I. Joe reference or is that just like in general? It is totally a G.I. Joe reference, okay. yes. Okay. Uh, so so uh and and in general, I think, you know, if you if you've got knowledge, you need some blue and red lasers there to complete the package. But um so circling I, I back on this, one thing that's interesting with WordPress 5.1 is they're talking about maybe having it enabled initially by default. Um or not like they're they're kind of going back and forth on this white screen of death um but it sounds like it, it's something that you know go ahead and look for it because they did plan to add an option where you can go ahead and disable the protection uh and really they suggest that you should only enable the protection if you're actually moving from you know a 5.x to a 7.x version of php and then go turn it off after you've done that so basically migrate make your fixes turn it off it's a really big, so uh, having a lot of experience with WordPress and from a development standpoint, um, when I first started playing with containers, my first thought was this needs to be in a containerized environment, largely because when you do upgrades, right, it's not just, it's a lot of things that need to be upgrades. So there's WordPress, there's themes, there's plugins, uh, there's PHP, and there's potentially, um, what is it, FPM, which is kind of like the, the app server uh, in there as well. So there's other PHP libraries and databases that all have to be upgraded. You can't, I mean, you need a development environment of some kind that's completely independent of your production environment if you're going to go in there and start mucking with stuff. I mean, unless you're really good. I, I'm not that good. I would break stuff all the time and so much so I had two environments. And actually, I would just switch them right? Like I would copy them, upgrade, get it working, and then just repoint. And then production would become development, development would become production. And I would just keep like flipping uh, back and forth, which is, I mean, we know from modern DevOps, not really the most efficient way to do it, right? And Keith's got his DevOps handbook down. Actually, uh, it is specifically what you are referring to is actually in the DevOps handbook. Oh, yeah. And it is on page 166. It's called the blue yellow pattern. So okay. actually, it is a DevOps. Thing it is. Too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Basically, you have a, a current state and a future state, and then you just switch over where you're pointing to, sure. and then your your back off plan is go back, and yeah. Like just switch it back. And and I guess my my point there is there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to WordPress, and folks with a lot of experience and that have the time to focus, and that's like their job, are going to do a really good job upgrading WordPress potentially, but it requires effort and systems and a process. I think that most people that are doing WordPress on their own probably aren't there yet. And if you're not, my suggestion is to move to some kind of hosted environment because you're probably better off there than trying to do it yourself. Even though if I mm -hmm. spent the time with it, sure, I could maintain our WordPress environments. Do I really, is that really want to put my focus to? I think is another thing that you have to take into consideration because there's so much complexity and so many moving parts. Uh, that That's just my opinion. It's a, a you know cost of time uh, mm. offset, right? Do you want to be a sysadmin or do you not want to be a sysadmin? Uh, or do you want to just pay out someone else to be your sysadmin and go on developing something, right? Yeah. So, well, it allowed um, me to but, spend more time with the actual theme and its functionality so that we could build much better right. web pages, right? I, I discovered the great you know layout and frames and our web pages are starting to look much better. To me, that was more important than spending time with plumbing, I took on, as I said in the beginning of the segment, many other projects where I'm applying those same you know, technical skills. 
Right, right. You're just reallocating the time to something else as Correct. opposed to your WordPress site. So mm-hmm. there it is. Um, so earlier you mentioned telemetry, uh, telemetry, Paul, and I actually yeah. wanted to go to um, kind of the if you build it, they will come section. So stories uh, one and two, as well as the food for thought story number two, all kind of touch on the same sort of idea or theme that I really wanted to cover this week, which is kind of the idea of like privacy, right? Or, mm-hmm. or uh, more so the ability to block ads specifically. Um so in story number one, under if you build it, they will come, they don't really get into the specifics of what Google is trying to do, which is why I pointed to story number two under food for thought. Um, but they all kind of get to the same problem, which is Google is looking to change the way that extensions are made such that it cannot allow or it will not allow for the rewriting of requests. So like a get request or a post request going to a specific site. Now, That effectively kills all current ad blocking extensions inside of Chromium today um, because that's what they do is they rewrite the request to Google to be like a rewrite of the request to localhost. And therefore, you don't get anything, you know, telemetry or otherwise going to Google's ad words or whatever, Mm -hmm. Um, which you could see why Google would want to do this because let's face it, they are effectively an advertising company, as is Facebook. Um, and at the same time, I can see also from a security standpoint why they're looking to do it because extensions being able to maliciously rewrite requests allows for people to go in, you know, either steal someone's extension or buy it from them and suddenly do malicious things with it. So it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. And I don't know, Paul, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this, actually. It's, it's one of the things that I've been looking into uh, is how to the best way to block ads and uh, first of all, in, from Google's perspective, they did last year or the year before propose a new ad blocking type system where it would, um, if you were an advertiser, right, or you were a website provider, that you could essentially the user would pay Google some money to block ads or unblock ads. And then Google would share some of that revenue with the people who made their money based on ads. It was like some really strange agreement like that. I don't think it ever took off. So Google, at least from a couple of years ago, is very, very conscious of ad block. I mean, they make a lot of money in their ad blocking service conceivably. I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but that's a huge revenue stream. It's in Google's best interest to allow ads, uh, which is interesting. So it comes down to the user, what's the best way to block ads? And I think, I, I don't, think that many of us want to like take revenue away from places however ads are annoying and ads are a potential security risk i mean let's let's be frank i mean it goes back to my research even three four years ago where if you get a list of ad uh, domains that are doing advertising and a list of domains that are listed as malicious there's overlap between the two certainly um, so it becomes problematic inside the browser is already pl- problematic i mean the ad blocker what is the one ad ad block pro the ad block Adblock. plus sorry plus. not pro go plus three. Yeah, yeah all those good months yep so i mean these work okay you go to a popular news site they're going to tell you to disable it so there goes all of your protections from malware potentially right for that site and then when you go to another site that like you're administering and you've got your ad blocker on it can mistake some functionality inside of that app as an ad and block it. I don't know if you've experienced that, Keith. I certainly have. Uh, the yep. internal sites I have to disable it. So that's a pain. And then you start looking at DNS um, ad blocking, and that's a whole other ball of wax. I, it's much cleaner from the user perspective because the user doesn't have to do anything, right? It doesn't matter what kind of browser you have, what kind of plugins you have, add ons, doesn't matter. Your local DNS caching server is doing that blocking for you. But that also, you're now you're blocking things based on domain, which means in our case, if you've got a legitimate Google ad, for example, or you want to test an advertiser's you know, redirect link, that's being blocked by your DNS server. The user can't turn that off without pointing to a new DNS server. So I, it's still, it's an issue for me today. And then you've got ISPs that may block connection attempts to other, other servers. So now I'm looking into like DNS over HTTPS, right? Because if it's HTTPS, I, I don't know. I don't know. There's all kinds. Yeah, of for things. me, it's it's a combination of a few things. So I'm using like Cloudflare's DNS mm-hmm. because they're not in the business of selling ads like you know Google is. So I'm not using Quad Eight. I'm using Quad One. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the other thing I do as well is I actually have a Docker container for Pi Hole, 
Uh, so there are you know pie hole uh, containers out there that you can just go and leverage, and that way it sits on my system. I am thinking of putting back my Raspberry Pi on my network as kind of a localized DNS for blocking. Now, for me, the other part of that that I use somewhat in conjunction with pie hole is the hosts file because at the end of the day, um, I don't have any traffic at all that goes to Facebook uh, from my system because I abhor a lot of the things that they've done, yeah. um, logically speaking. So I just block them wholesale from my laptop, but my wife does use Facebook, so it's like I can't block it on uh, on the network as DNS because that will just cause you know a little bit of uh, friction in the household, to say the least. But sure. It's, it's interesting that um, you know basically Google for the right intentions I think is looking to um, do away with the ability to rewrite requests as part of an extension, but it, it ends up hurting I think customers more or even you know not even really customers because that's the advertising people, but it's it hurts the user base more by not having ad blockers that are effective. Um, so I don't know. The other side of this that that uh, really brought it forward with uh, story number two under food for thought was the fact that, um, as we announced, I think some time ago, Microsoft is uh, kind of doing away with the Edge HTML browser and, and moving it to a Chromium base. So mm. you effectively end up with a, a kind of a you know unified ecosystem. Uh, which, if they go ahead and move forward with the ability to you know no longer do ad blocking, that's going to cause problems. Um, which actually under story number two. It's interesting to see that Mozilla is taking the opposite track with this. So they have a, a, a browser specifically for the mobile environment called Firefox Focus. And I didn't know about this you know, before you know, reading the article, but Firefox Focus is intended to you know, really slim down the Firefox browser so that you can focus on what you're browsing through. And one of the things that they're looking to add is ad blocking technology because ads are annoying, but they're also distracting. And by the way, they also, you know, not maybe more often than not, but they have a strong preponderance or a strong history of uh, delivering malware of some mm -hmm. variety to people. And especially with the Android ecosystem being what it is, mm -hmm. you definitely want to block ads if you're on an Android device, let alone, yep. uh, you know, thinking about this from a, from a different perspective. So I thought that was kind of cool. And Mozilla taking this in a different direction than Google, which, you know, they're the only other browser out there today other than Safari, I guess, or Opera. It's true. I, I haven't done a lot of the as much research as I should have. But, uh, you know, in a, a quick test, uh, Firefox, the thing I like about Chrome is if I log in with my Gmail account or G Suite uh, account, all my stuff follows me, whatever browser I use. Right. So it can be on my laptop, on my desktop, on my desktop at home a desktop at work and it's a seamless browser experience everything is is always there which is and that's nice that's the way they want it yeah well yeah well they, they mean, want you to keep your google account they want you to use chrome and yeah, they want to track all your ads and activity you, right? yeah, exactly. exactly exactly that's how they track you is mm -hmm. is uh that's why people um you know when you're logged into google and you're just searching the web or you you leave yourself logged into google guess what you bet your you know you bet your ass that they're actually yeah. grabbing all that data in the process which is why one of the things i do when I'm actively, uh, you know, using the the web for something that's one of my Google domain registrars, I use it in like a, a private window, like a you know, just the private mode, and then everything else is logged out of Google because I yes. don't want to use that browser for anything that I'm browsing to. Incognito mode. Yes. AKA you, but... porn mode. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using it simply to make sure that Google is sandbox, but you use it for whatever. You you, want. Yeah, you know, our listeners use it for whatever you like. Just saying, some people use it for that. So um, I wanted to actually jump because I know that we have our interview coming up here with Jing She uh, in a moment, Dr. Jing She, excuse me, um, is learning and tools. Uh, so I, th I found some kind of cool ones this week to play around with. Um, one is by Jerry Gamblin, who we have to get on the show at some point because um, he writes a lot of really cool tools. And you'll find that if you go to any of our learning and tool sections, he almost always has something in there just because of the, the different projects he's working on. But this one is cool because it's a dependency check using GitHub Actions. Now, GitHub Actions aren't quite uh, like a CI tool. They're sort of like a hybrid of that. Um, but what it does is it will go ahead and it will use uh, all dependency checks in Ruby and Node packages and fail uh, effectively for the push if any of them have a CVSS score above 7, which I thought was kind of cool. It's like automatic built-in security. So if your company is using GitHub and you've got GitHub Actions enabled, you can block them from using packages that are going to cause vulnerabilities to be inserted into your pipeline. 
So I thought this was awesome considering, you know, just how many packages out there that could potentially be malicious as we saw a lot last year. Yeah, I like that. So uh, Keith, how is he determining if a, a package is uh, has a vulnerability? So it looks like he's using the dependency check um, tool, like software, mm -hmm. as a Docker file. So he's got a, a Docker file that pulls down uh, dependency check, and dependency check itself is what ends up uh, checking for that. So I think that dependency check as a public or open source repository mm -hmm. is um, is something that uses, you know, it kind of keeps up on the CVSS scoring data as it's released publicly, and then uses that library to go ahead and check against, um, you know, the different dependencies that you're pulling down for Ruby packages or Node packages accordingly. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, because I mean, all that stuff is usually public when it gets to right. CVSS. You can get that from somewhere. I mean, the thing is, of course, that we should add the caveat, not everything gets a CVE and not yes. everything has a CVSS score, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely so, true. But then again, I'm not going to let perfect be the enemy of good here. And I think that this is actually yeah. a good solution. So um, definitely going to play with it at, at some point with some of my projects because uh, I'm sure that I've got things in there that I should be more aware of and I'm just not. And mm -hmm. I think that that's awesome. Uh, the other thing is kind of continuing on the whole uh, container uh, side of things as well, which I thought was really cool, is there's a, something called bin container or bin CTR, um, which is uh, it's, it's number three under learning and tools on the wiki. And it's a fully static, including root FS embedded binary that pops you directly into a container as inspired by some of the work of Jesse Frizzell and uh, Crosby Michael. Uh, so it might be Michael Crosby, but it's at Crosby Michael on Twitter. And I thought this was pretty awesome. So it's basically you can create an executable file, but the executable file itself actually drops you into a container. So it is truly segmented from the rest of your environment. It's almost like making your operating system able to support a mini version of cubes like cube OS, mm -hmm. which Cool. That is really cool. And if you think about it this way, Paul, right? If, if you're running Docker containers, for the most part, that means that it's going to be cross-platform, regardless. Oh, so it's like a shell you can take with you. Yeah, sort of. I mean, it, it's like a binary you can take with you, right? Mm. So if, if you've built it so that it can run successfully inside of the container, well, for the most part, now again, it's not perfect, but for Mac OS and for Linux, at least, that binary should be executable on both of them because of the Docker Community Edition being so close to one another for those ecosystems. Yep. You might have some minor problems in the mm. Windows ecosystem for Community Edition. Sure. I had some problems when I was giving a training at DerbyCon with that. Um, but for the most part, it means you now have portable binaries that are perhaps natively executed inside of the container. So as long as you compiled it inside of the container, you're good. If you run the container in the Linux subsystem for Windows, will it have a better chance of running? That's really weird. It's like a, it's like a an environment within an environment within an environment. <laughs> It's an Ouroboros, right? Yeah. It's it's effectively like it's the container inside of the Windows system, which is nested. It has like a nested Linux system that's running a nested Linux system. I feel system like it's when you've got a mirror in front of you and a mirror behind you and it looks like an infinite. Yes. Yeah, that's kind of what it yes. feels like. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's it's a it's a perpetual problem. But if it works, then I'm not going mm. to to shun it by any means. I just thought that this was a really cool project that people should know about. And of course, uh, there was the last one, which is, again, can kind of continuing on a theme here, is uh, there's a testing environment for manual security testers called Shoot, S-H-0-0-T. Uh, so this is off of the Kitplate website that I've referred back to on a few times. And effectively, it's intended for you to be able to go ahead and take uh, take notes of different kinds and also have uh, you know standardized uh, things that you should walk through from a tester's perspective to allow you to make sure that, okay, make sure you check for this, make sure you check for that. So make sure you check for SQL injection, make sure you check for auth bypass, but then also have like templatized reports that you can just kind of drop in. So now you've found a SQL injection and you're going to go report it to a bug bounty program. It's already templatized for you. You can just, you know, drop it all in with the data of where you found it, you're done. Um, so that, that was kind of cool as well. Awesome. So, Lastly, I uh, just want to point people to our commit strip article or uh, comic of the week, number three under food for thought. It's called It's Not Magic. With that, we are going to take a short break and then come back with our interview with Dr. Jing Shea. 